I'm a real believer that science is cheap. It's really quite inexpensive. You look at the budget of the NIH compared to the budget of the, the federal government, it's a drop in the bucket. When I look at how uh, resources are uh, uh, made available for science in this country compared to other countries with, of which I'm aware, um, I think we do a good job. When money is really tight, processes can get too conservative. And so, you know, if someone has an idea that's out there, um, odds are pretty good it's wrong. But there's also a decent chance it might be not just right, but field changing. You know, real, 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 real paradigm changing. And those kinds of things, if you lose those opportunities, that's terrible. So, so the question becomes how, when resources are tight, do you manage to fund science you're confident is going to make important contributions, but, but not lose the things that might not work, but if they worked, oh, they'd be fantastic. One of the reasons it's so exciting to be a geneticist right now, and, and for the last 10 years, are, are, are the technological innovations. And some of those are experimental, some of those are computational, some of those are statistical. Um, you know, I like to say that when, when I first got in the business and started teaching a course in statistical genetics in 1984 was the first time I offered my course. For the first three or four times I taught the course, my last lecture, I'd make some predictions of things that might happen in two years and five years and ten years. It wasn't always exactly that, but that's effectively what it was. And after each of the first three times, initially I was teaching this course every other year, the first three times I taught the course, my predictions were hopeless, not in the sense that they didn't happen, but the ten-year stuff was already done. You know, to be in a field that's moving that quickly is incredibly exciting. When I started in the field, we couldn't talk about doing something genome-wide. We didn't have the ability to type genetic markers, to type locations across the genome. There were just a few places we could look. And so we were like the proverbial guy with, you know, the lamppost and, you know, why are you looking there when you know it's over there? Well, this is the place where there's light, you know? That's the way it was when I started. And then in uh, 1980, uh, a paper came out actually with two folks here from the University of Utah, Ray White and Mark Skolnick were, were two of the four people on this paper, talked about uh, a strategy for uh, identifying places across the genome, sort of throughout the genome in a way that would allow um, a complete look or at least uh, a, a relatively comprehensive look across the genome. That was something that was not very by our current standards, cost-effective, but it was possible. Then along came microsatellite markers, another class of genetic markers that we could type more cheaply uh, across the genome that allowed us a more comprehensive look. And then with genotyping arrays, uh, the era of GWAS came in in about 2006. That allowed us to type hundreds of thousands of places across the genomes, hundreds of thousands of genetic variants, and to do a much more complete look. And we could do that initially for sort of $1,000 a person. Now we can do it for sort of $50 a person. And now we do sequencing. And we can now sequence the entire human genome, well, almost the entire. There are little bits we don't get. But, but for about $1,000, again, and so instead of, you know, a few hundred markers across, well, first not being able to do anything comprehensive, then a few hundred markers for maybe 1,000 or more per person, then, you know, a dense set of markers, maybe a few hundred thousand, um, and, and now the whole sequence. And more or less the same cost each time, more or less $1,000 plus or minus, you know, one order of magnitude, being able to look carefully across the genome in greater and greater detail. That's one important technological advance. Another important technological advance is um, computing costs. Computing costs have gone down uh, exponentially, very consistently exponentially for a long period of time. Um, and that's enabled us to deal with large data sets in principle. And then the third technological advance is in statistics, the statistical methods that more efficiently analyze the data to come to sound conclusions to extract as much information as possible uh, out of the data being generated. Experiments that would have been totally science fiction even five years ago are now science reality. In my talk today, I talked about an example, a paper by Neil Risch and Kathleen Marikangas, where they, in 1996, put forward the notion of genome-wide association study, where they said, well, suppose we could type genetic markers, say a few hundred thousand genetic markers across the genome in people with disease and people without, and, and compared 
you know, what, what was different in terms of their genetic constitution. And I actually reviewed that paper for science, and I said, this is science fiction, but this is a really cool idea. You should publish it even though we can't do this, because maybe someday we can. Well, 10 years later, that was our standard technique. I can find 100 places in the genome that are associated with type 2 diabetes. I can find uh, 50 places in the genome associated with schizophrenia um, that you know, we just didn't know about. We couldn't detect. We didn't have the power, scientific power, the scientific resources to be able to find them. And every one of those places in the genome we detect as being associated with type 2 diabetes is a possible new drug target. It's a possible place this might help us understand why some people are helped by a drug, why other people are not. Um, so to me that's really cool.